here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello there, I'm Tiki Fullerton. Every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meet. Coming up, what Labour promises you in a new government. Shadow Assistant Treasurer Andrew Lee, direct from the ALP annual conference, tells us what he would rather do with the government's $9 billion windfall announced today. Australia's top budget economist, Deloitte's Chris Richardson, gives us his take on the state of the economy after the mid-year economic fiscal outlook is released and where the government is most likely to spend up during the election campaign. And one of the inland missing links, the inland rail. What can it deliver for Australia? And having turned the first sod in parks last week, can the project managers deliver on time and on budget? ARTC Managing Director John Fullerton joins us. Another Labour conference in train, but this time there is clearly something different in the air. And even the government's strategically placed MAIFO announcement, the mid-year economic fiscal outlook, didn't really dent the conference today. Labour is on a roll and it knows it. Scott Morrison is right there. The one thing that can't happen is for some internal blue at the often vocal gathering. Some things have been carefully preempted. Exhibit A, the New Deal on a higher intake of refugees. It took the wind out of the left stroke hard left difference on asylum seekers. Here's Sky News' David Spears. It is very well orchestrated and I've covered you know, these Labor conferences uh, right back to the days they were in Hobart. This one is being managed far more carefully given the expectation of a Labor win around the corner and no one wanting to stuff that up. Well, there you go. Now, it's pretty clear that Team Morrison tactics were to do anything could to take the shine off Labor. The Prime Minister took the unusual step of announcing the next Governor-General on Sunday, David Hurley. But it couldn't dent today's Ipsos Fairfax poll, which confirms that Labor is on track for a comfortable victory with a 54-46 majority uh, two-party preferred. Now, Bill Shorten is even gaining on Scott Morrison's clear lead as preferred Prime Minister. The government knew that Maifo would be one of the big shots that it has left in the locker. With the economy still running well and both company profits and more jobs contributing to a much better budget story. A first time surplus predicted for 2019-20, a cumulative uh, extra $15 billion surplus over the forward estimates and over $9 billion to electioneer with. The Frydenberg Corman Presser this morning used the good old one-two delivery. But I tell you what will deliver a worse outcome for the workers of Australia, and that's the $200 billion of higher taxes that Bill Shorten and the Labor Party are promising. The last time uh, I've seen uh, the Labor Party this cocky about the uh, upcoming election, and the last time <laughs> I remember senior representatives uh, of uh, the press gallery declaring the election result five months out, uh, was uh, 2001 when Kim Beasley, as opposition leader for five years, thought he was going to sail uh, into the lodge. And of course, uh, everybody knows uh, the final outcome. Well, the gov government is now targeting the grey vote with more in-home aged care places announced today and support for the increasing number of ageing baby boomers and indeed their parents also still alive and kicking, of course. The $9 billion in unannounced measures is sure to mean tax cuts, especially given the emphasis the Treasurer put on his tax to GDP cap of 23.9%, which he says Labor has abandoned. Don't forget that $9 billion plus is also there for a shortened government were Labor to win. We see the continuation of five years of confusion and chaos in the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government and particularly when it comes to budget and economics. Now, Labor's higher taxes in proposed changes to franking credits, which hit largely the old, and negative gearing, which would happen in a softening housing market, and where voters incidentally are split 43 pro and 44 against in the Ipsos poll, give voters a clear choice between Labor and the government. There's also Labor's NEG on energy, of course, but most importantly, perhaps, what Labor does have going for it now is that it's a party that's not having to deal with bitter division, as it has in the past under Rudd Gillard Rudd and as the Liberals are still dealing with now. It's why getting through the Labor conference without fur flying is so important. 
Well, to add insult to injury today, the government lost yet another front bencher with the Nationals. Andrew Broad resigning after being caught up in a sex scandal using the Sugar Baby website to meet younger women on overseas trips. All that hard work on my EFO, only to be matched with yet more dishevelment. Well, for the key takeouts of today's MyEFO release, Sky News political reporter Annalise Nielsen is out of the lockup. She's still breathing and she joins me live from Canberra. Annalise, can you run through that for us? What were the big takeouts of MyEFO? Well, the biggest takeout has to be that surplus. It's something mm. the government did foreshadow and they've indeed delivered on in this particular forecast. They're predicting $4.1 billion extra in the budget for next year. And so that's something they say is the symptom of very good economic management. As you can imagine, that is, uh, that's the line that they're pushing. They're saying that this is going to help them keep the budget in balance and they're quite happy with that GDP ratio as well. But the big takeaway is this unallocated revenue. We've seen over $10 billion and the budget is mm. uh, still earmarked for future announcements, but they haven't said what they are. And that's something the opposition has taken umbrage with. They're saying that they can't really comment on what that's going to be if they uh, don't say what it is. That's uh, the government's war chest, really, going into the election. They've got this $10 billion that they can use for tax cuts or they can use it for election promises. Either way, they're in a very comfortable position heading into the next election. And it's the strongest indicator yet that they are ready to go to an early election if they want to. That means that even if they don't make that April budget that they've promised and that May election date, if we go earlier, they will be able to make election promises and say that they have been costed. Yeah, and, and it looks like that uh, some of that money at least will go to tax cuts, you'd think, given that they want to keep the, uh, the tax to GDP cap where it is. And, uh, and that's exactly right, Tiki. And what they've been saying is that they're really attached to that $4.1 billion surplus now. And so that's a key issue mm. for the government, that whatever they, predict, whatever they put into the budget, they can't go any lower than that, because then that will become the opposition tagline, is that they're depleting the surplus and they're on their way to financial ruin. As you know, things always get very heated going into an election campaign. We already heard a bit of that today. As you prefaced, there has been some pushback from Labor, they have been saying that they wouldn't be lowering taxes, but they would have more spending in key areas that they think is important. And we're hearing a lot of those different uh, policy priorities coming out of the conference in Adelaide at the moment. But what we're expecting from the coalition is very targeted promises. Already they've pr promised, I think it's uh, $553 million for an aged care package that would include more mm. aged care places. That was all part of the MyEFO budget. Uh, they were very on a very good news story this morning before the Andrew Broad story broke. But, um, yeah, yeah, well, ex been... exactly. Well, let's come, let's come to that right now. Uh, I mean, how damaging. I mean, that really took the shine off MyEFO, surely. Oh, absolutely. And it's just really odd that the Nationals leader, Michael McCormack, acknowledged in this very quickly called and brief press conference when the news broke that he had known about this for two weeks. And so it's unusual that New Idea broke it before anyone else got to the story. And it is quite an extraordinary one, just because Andrew Broad is one of the first MPs who was calling out Barnaby Joyce for his uh, indiscretions earlier in the year, which saw him ousted as leader. He was the, one of the first ones saying he wasn't representing family values and had to go. So it is quite a turnaround to see him accused of something almost equally salacious. It's um, something that Michael McCormick's also said that there could be an AFP investigation and there hasn't been a lot of clarity about what that would be around. It's uh, un unclear from the circumstances why AFP would be investigating whether that's something to do with Hong Kong jurisdiction or what, but this story is certainly not over. Yeah, well, Andrew Broad, obviously, in a very large greenhouse there, throwing stones uh, at, at Barnaby Joyce <laughs> earlier. Um, so, so this is likely to kick on, is it, this scandal? Well, it is quite an extraordinary thing to happen. It's quite yeah. a salacious thing, and it's one of those stories that does translate to the general public. While we're all buried deep in papers in my EFO lockup this morning, and most of yeah. the general public wouldn't know what my EFO was, everyone yeah. knows what a sugar daddy website is. So. Well, indeed. So finally, um, how do you see the, um, the, the, the Labor ALP conference ending up? There doesn't seem to, be, it seems to have been any huge spats and rows, which sometimes the, the conference can be, uh, can be famous for. Everything is very controlled, as David Spears was saying. 
It seems like a very well-oiled machine at the moment. Everyone's mm. very much on the same page. If it wasn't for those protesters making everyone's life difficult, it probably would be all a bit boring. But um, it is something where you can sense that an election's coming. We're expecting later today a speech about um, the, the Labor position on Nauru and Manus Island, and that's likely to be getting at least the conversation going with the government and getting a bit of fire in that conversation there. But yeah, so far you're absolutely right. It does seem like it's all very happy families on the Labor side. They're all locked in and ready to fight an election. Mm. Annalise Nelson, thank you so much for that wrap. That's terrific. Thanks. Yeah. And a short time ago, I caught up with a shadow assistant treasurer, Andrew Lee, who was down at the ALP conference as well, of course, in Adelaide. Andrew Lee, very good to talk. Now, the government seems pretty pleased with how the economy looks. 2019-20, the first budget surplus since the last year of the Howard government, and it seems to have $10 billion to play with going forward. Well, the government would uh, continually criticise Wayne Swan for the fact that while he announced surpluses, the biggest downturn since the, global, since the Great Depression uh, meant that they weren't able to be delivered. Uh, and yet now they want credit because they have announced a surplus. The fact is they haven't delivered a surplus, Tiki. This is a team of people who, in 2013, pledged the budget would be in surplus in their first year and every year after that. Five years on, net debt has doubled, gross debt's gone through half a trillion dollars, and the government's yet to deliver a surplus. Right, but of course Labor is also guilty of promising and promising a surplus. You don't think we're closer than we have been in a very long time? Well, don't forget the conditions under which Labor was governing. Uh, virtually every other advanced country went into recession. Uh, we were extraordinary in that period not to go into recession, uh, largely because of fiscal sti stimulus and the automatic stabilisers that cut in. The government can't say that. They've got fantastic economic circumstances globally at the moment, but they're failing to act on things like productivity, uh, de tackling inequality, getting wages growing again. I mean, workers have barely gotten a pay rise since the government came to office in 2013, Tiki. That's a real serious situation for retail spending. Wages and, and wages growth is a problem or an issue globally, as you would know. What they have achieved is considerable jobs growth, though. Look, you've had solid employment growth, but you still look across to, say, Germany or the United States, and you see countries with 4% uh, unemployment, not 5 point something. Uh, we can do better on the employment front, I believe. We ought to be pushing hard for full employment. We ought to be making sure that workers are getting a share of productivity growth. Productivity growth hasn't been stellar in recent years, but it hasn't been uh, zero, which is essentially the real wage rises that workers have been getting. Unless you're a CEO, your pay, pay packet's been uh, failing to do more than just keep pace with inflation. So, Andrew Lee, would you then be supportive of some of the union push to welcome industry-wide bargaining as a solution to that? Well, we're having those conversations with, uh, with the industrial wing of the party, uh, Tiki. But there's other things we can do. We need to make sure that labour hire isn't used to drive down conditions, but instead goes back to its original purpose of, of filling temporary vacancies. We should restore penalty rates, uh, which means you're putting money back into the pockets of people who go straight back and spend it in the economy, while, of course, protecting the weekend and redu reducing inequality. And we need to make sure we crack down Ill on illegal Phoenix activities, which is hurting workers as well as honest businesses. So there's a lot we can do to kickstart wage growth in Australia. A, a big concern to small businesses would be if you do turn around the decision on penalty rates, of course. Well, small businesses uh, rely on people's spending. Uh, you know, dumb businesses think that they can get away with having low-paid workers and high-paid customers. Smart businesses recognise that their workers are their customers and they're making sure that you've got a well-paid workforce boost retail sales. You listen to the Reserve Bank recently, Tiki, you would have heard them as concerned about the uh, languid wage situation as anyone. There, if you look at the new car sales uh, data, again, that's, uh, that's lousy because wage growth is lousy. It's holding back our, our economy. So workers need a pay rise so the economy can get going more rapidly. But Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg don't have a single policy that would push wages back up again. So, uh, going back to the spending in MyEFO, uh, spending growth now down to 1.9%, the lowest level in 50 years, as the Treasurer points out. Now, he's also questioning where you are with the tax-to-GDP cap. He points out that Chris Bowen's commitment on that sort of cap seems to have been abandoned. Uh, well, Tiki, you can understand why uh, he's focusing on the issue of spending growth 
rather than just what they spend as a share of the economy. Uh, we're back to Howard era high spending levels uh, over the forward estimates looking at 23 to 24 per cent of GDP. And that's been the, the legacy of the coalition government. Uh, they came to office promising that they would br bring down spending. Uh, in fact, what we've seen is that two-thirds of, of the budget uh, improvement uh, the, uh, since, uh, the, since, the, since the budget came down uh, has been due to increased revenues. It's not savvy economic management. It's great global circumstances. While they have kept to the cap, though, is, is Labor abandoning the tax-to-GDP cap? Well, Labor believes that uh, we should keep you know, government uh, taxation as low as possible in order to fund the services available. And we believe that we should be spending in the right areas. But if the question is, does, should Australia make sure we close multinational tax loopholes so we can expand ch early childhood to three-year-olds, we're absolutely supportive of that. Uh, so there's no magic about these figures. Tiki. You've got to make the right decision that Australia needs in the interests of our future. We need more infrastructure investment, we need uh, more, more money going into public schools. Uh, you didn't see the sort of uh, investment in early childhood uh, in this uh, budget update that I'd been hoping for. No, nothing for three-year-olds, but not ever the extension of the funding for four-year-olds. That's a real problem for the productive capacity of the economy. Now, you've obviously got an ambitious spending plan, as you mentioned. Part of the spending would be paid for, one would think, by your tax raising, including the $1.7 billion from changes to negative gearing. Now, what are the chances of that policy being implemented were you to get into government in 2019? Because you'd need it, wouldn't you, to raise the revenue? Tiki, we're confident that we'll win a mandate to reform uh, negative, negative gearing, the capital gains tax discount. Uh, we're going to fight hard for every vote in this election. Uh, but we know that the home ownership rate in Australia is the lowest it's been in 60 years. That young people are beaten, being beaten out at auctions around the country uh, by investors. So we've got to reform these tax breaks and that's what all the experts tell us. But the budget, uh, budget is also better off as a result of uh, Labor decisions which the Coalition opposed. We had the BHP... But how are you going to do it, Andrew? Uh, you're very concerned about uh, wealth inequality. How are you going to do it? You're going to spend a quarter of a million dollars on low-cost rental, for example, but there's no guarantee you're going to be able to get the negative gearing through. How are you going to pay for this? Well, Tiki will work constructively with crossbenchers as we've engaged with experts. Now, I'm here at the uh, Labor National, National Conference uh, speaking to a broad cross-section of Australian society at the conference. Uh, we've got progressive activists, we've got people from the union movement, we've got people from the business community, and we've got regular Australians who've just joined a branch and want to be involved in Australia's oldest and greatest political party. And it's that spirit of constructive practical engagement that we'd bring to our dealings with the crossbench if we were fortunate enough to win government. Uh, we're ambitious for the nation, Tiki, and we want to make sure that we're able to, uh, to implement these, uh, these reforms that Australia needs to ensure that young people of modest means can buy a home. Uh, that shouldn't be beyond the great Australian dream. One of the inequality issues, and there have been lots of calls from, from Chris Richardson right through to ACOS, uh, has been to do something about the new start allowance. Now, there seems to be a bipartisan pushback against substantially raising the new start allowance. Why? New start's too low. Now, view is it needs to be reviewed. Uh, we're approaching this with exactly the same spirit we approached the pension. Uh, in 2007, we didn't go to the Australian people promising a dollar increase in the pension. We promised a methodical review, which was then conducted by Jeff Harmer, and resulted in the largest increase in the pension in its 100-year history, taking over a million pensioners out of poverty. Out, out of poverty. Uh, so we need, to, we need to carefully review this. I don't believe we've seen the, uh, the, the sort of review uh, that we envisage, which would look at impact on employment, on household wellbeing, get the balance right and have a strongly defend defensible decision that flow flowed from that. All right. A Andrew, you're down there at the Labor conference. Tell me, what's the mood down there this time round? Tiki, there's a, a real sense of um, uh, purposeness and a, a sense, almost a, 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 a sober, sober methodical uh, preparation for the opportunity to, go, to govern. Uh, we know that this election will be a tough election, but we also know there's massive challenges facing Australia which only a Labor government can, uh, can tackle. Whether it's climate change or energy prices, reconciliation or wage growth, 
it takes a Labor government to tackle, to tackle those challenges. But coming from opposition into government is a hard ask. And so people, people have a real sense of seriousness around this conference. Uh, there's no fun and frivolity. I'm reminded of the, the biblical saying about the time to, to set aside childish things. There is a sense that Labor must be the party uh, of uh, adults in the room, uh, that Australians are fed up with the revolving door in the Prime Minister's office, the backbiting, the loss of ministers that the coalition is seeing. Uh, they want good, sensible, engaged government. And that's what they'd get under a shortened Labor government. Finally, uh, revolving doors is the case for Labor as well as the coalition. Uh, I see the Prime Minister today was accusing Labor of assuming victory. Uh, you're talking about a certain level of control and seriousness. Presumably that's exactly what had to happen. It's a, a very controlled conference. Well, people have been negotiating on a whole range of things and, and that's what uh, a good political party does. Uh, we talk to everyone, we work it through, we arrive at the sensible centrist approach. Uh, we've uh, been stable and united under Bill Shorten for more than five years now, having changed our rules to give that stability to the party. And that's then channelled itself, uh, Tiki, into this focus on policy. We'll go to the next election with the most comprehensive economic manifesto of any party in my lifetime. Uh, a, pa a policy of reform for the sorts of issues that Australia needs. Under the leadership of Chris, uh, Chris Bowen, Tanya Plibersek, Jim Chalmers and of course Bill Shorten, uh, if we are given the opportunity of governing, we will do so methodically and precisely. We will be exactly the same government after the election as we promised to be beforehand. Andrew Lee, thanks as always for joining us and all the best for Christmas. Thank you, Dickie. You too. After the break, the ACCC taking major airlines to court. We'll get the details next with our chief business reporter, Leah Shanahan. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. Well, he's a very busy man, Rod Sims. The ACCC has taken more action against corporate Australia, this time against the nation's four major airlines. Jetstar, Tiger Air, Qantas and Virgin Australia have been caught up in trying to dupe the flying public. After it emerged, they made force or misleading representation about consumers' rights to refunds. The ACCC found the refund policies of all four airlines when it came to delays and cancellations failed to comply with the law. Meanwhile, Jetstar will pay a hefty $1.95 million penalty for breaching consumer law. The airline had falsely claimed some fares were non-refundable. Well, for more, Your Money Chief Business Reporter Leo Shanahan joins me live at the desk. Leo, you went down to the ACCC and uh, spoke to Rod Sims. Yes, yeah, spoke to the very busy Rod Sims, Indeed. of course. Uh, Talking about yeah. taking out the trash before the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, but yes, Jetstar, uh, facing almost a $2 million fine now, so this is uh, not That's small. not insignificant on the bottom line, no, is it? No, it's not, uh, especially for airlines at the moment. And look, uh, this is on the back of basically fares and conditions uh, and, uh, well, inability for people to actually claim refunds, telling customers uh, that they can't get refunds when actually under Australian consumer law they can. Now, a lot of us might have experienced this uh, with weather delays or uh, other forms of delays that take place, mm. especially when people have bought cheap affairs. Uh, they're being told that they can't have a refund mm. uh, because that fare was on sale. It was a cheap affair. So, you needed to be in a so higher So the idea is un under consumer law, if, if something wasn't your fault at all, mm. it was something not just, it wasn't the airline's fault, but it was beyond your control, force of nature, whatever. Exactly. And we're not talking about you somebody cancelling a, a, a flight under a sale. If mm. it's not your decision to do that and you don't fly, uh, Rod Sims is pretty clear in the ACCC that you should be entitled. Now, why did they target Jetstar with this $2 million final? Have a look at what uh, Rod Sims said about Jetstar. For some time we've had complaints from consumers flying with all sorts of airlines. That prompted us to uh, put the airlines on notice, which we did about a year ago, uh, we looked at all the airlines' policies and, in our view, Jetstars were the worst. They were the ones who mentioned no refund more often than others. They were the ones who suggested that the consumer law rights, your right to a consumer guarantee, actually does not apply. We'll be watching all airlines in future and if we find further breaches of the law, if we find 
further evidence of consumers being told there are no refunds, then we will act and the penalties will be significant. So Rod Sims warning other airlines who have also had action taken against them. Now all the major airlines, uh, Jetstar as well, but Tiger, Qantas and Virgin will all have to alter uh, mm. their terms and conditions as it relates to uh, the cancellation of flights and refunds. Yes. Uh, so look, they've all been caught up in this and it's pretty significant, especially going into the Christmas period. All right. Now from airlines to banking. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, we get, gather NAB's chief executive has got an extended holiday Two coming up. Two months leave for uh, Andrew Thorburn. Now, uh, the cat was set amongst the pigeons this afternoon uh, with this story. Our colleague Joyce Malakis in uh, The Australian had this story. Now, it's interesting, d depending on who you believe, yes. uh, this is either the beginning of the end for Thorburn or as NAB is really? saying, well, you know, uh, he's taking an extra month off. He does have this long service leave. It's yeah. there for a reason. It's just that ultimately a lot of uh, chief executives, it's generally unheard of them to so, use so it within So how would you tenure. rank him in the terms of the top four chief executives in terms of the, the year that they've had and how they've handled it with the Royal Commission? Uh, well, I think he's the fourth, the, the last. I mean, he's had the toughest time. Yep. I think he's probably handled it. Uh, the worst at times, but also mm. just the bank's record itself mm. has really worked against him. And he's been there the longest. The others do have the, the ability, I think, the, uh, Matt Commons, uh, even Shane well, Elliott, sort of to say a lot of this didn't happen under my watch. Yes. Uh, Matt Common especially can say that NAB has probably been worst off, uh, only only CBA has probably been worse off compared to NAB and look now he's got this criminal investigation into his former chief of staff in the middle of the office. Yeah. Uh, there's you know there's a lot going on at NAB and the question is can Thorburn really hang on? He is by his own admittance this afternoon he's put out a he put out a statement uh, to his internal group saying look I spent time with our executive leadership group uh, told them of my plans, the most relentless, biggest and most relentless year of my career, he called it. And I know this is true. He's taking Christmas, New Year period off January and then coming back to report on the Royal Commission yeah. and then having another month off in he, that He period. told you as much, did he? Well, look, have a look at what uh, Andrew Thorburn told me in uh, November when I spoke to him mm. at results time. He did allude to taking a break. Will I be speaking to you next year at uh, Results or will it be Mike Baird or someone else? Are you planning to stick around? Yeah, well, look, I love what I do, Leo. Uh, I believe the bank's purpose and vision is the right purpose and vision. The team I work with are good. We're underway in a transformation and um, I've been in banking for over 30 years and I believe in it more now than I ever did, notwithstanding what's happened. And um, I certainly want going to take a good break at the end of the year, but uh, I'm looking forward to the year ahead. So, yeah, Looking forward to the year ahead. A good break. So going back to the issues uh, with his former EA, now that's obviously a court case which is a, or a case which is going on, yeah. right? Um, and it's becoming more and more spectacular. Well, as we've reported in the last couple of weeks, we've got the Australian Crime Commission freezing assets. We had those raids last week. Yeah. So this is coming to a very point We've got AVOs. Can go, we, of yeah. this uh, investigation. Yeah. Now, if charges were pressed in this investigation for Andrew Thorburn to be on deck at, to at that time where a lot of details were coming out... Yeah, notwithstanding we should say once again that... Um, no, know, yes, Andrew no Thorburn charges have been laid in and Andrew Thorburn is not a suspect in the no, case. No. But this did relate, uh, as we understand, to an investigation that involves his chief of staff. Mm. So if details are dripping out in that period and he's on deck, uh, maybe it's easy to say, well, He's away for this period, and in well, just because the optics of it are so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. look, it's a, it's a really tricky one. I don't think it makes it any better that he's away. Maybe it mm. means that he doesn't have to deal with, and they can always say. And what about the sort of broader largesse that um, the NAB? Obviously, you were talking about it earlier. Yeah. And I think that's what's <coughs> going to hurt Andrew Thorburn in this case. It's not so much criminal implications on, on, on himself or other executives around him. It's, it's taking the, the top management away for these... They're taking these trips and it's this banking largesse in a context of the Royal Commission, in a context of a general uh, anger towards the sector. Mm. Uh, so look, we've got a, a AGM on Wednesday in which they're likely to, uh, to have a first strike and probably a record against them. Mm. So that just really caps off a Annus Horribilis for him. Right, well, I look forward to talking to you about that after that's happened. Leo Shanahan, thank you very much. Thanks to you.
After the break, we'll get the numbers crunched on today's MIFA update. Partner at Deloitte Access Economics, Chris Richardson, will join me next. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Yes, welcome back. Well, let's go to back to the top story now and the release of the media fiscal economic outlook, MyEFO. We've convinced budget guru Chris Richardson from Deloitte to come back and talk to us all about it. He joins me now from Canberra. Uh, Chris, you've had a chance to have, I know, a couple of hours look at uh, this. What do you read now into the MyEFO tea leaves? Is it as good as uh, you expected it to be? Uh, it's, it's almost exactly what we expected it to be. And in a sense, the surprising thing is there were no surprises, uh, not in terms of the economy, not in terms of the budget. Mostly good news um, on the economy, as we know, the, the good news is in jobs and in profits uh, rather than in, in wages. But good news on profits tends to be something that absolutely supercharges uh, the budget. Uh, you, you're seeing Treasury say there'll now be a lot more money in the budget bucket uh, than when they last did these estimates uh, six months ago, $31 billion more over the next four years. Uh, but the government's already got some plans uh, for that. It's already mm. set aside essentially uh, half of that money. Right. So uh, I was speaking to uh, Shadow Assistant Treasurer Andrew Lee earlier in the show and he was saying, look, it's outrageous that they're promising this surplus. I mean, uh, we, uh, we, Wayne Swan, promised a surplus under Labor and it was only because of the GFC we couldn't deliver that. Uh, they haven't got a surplus either. What is the chance that there might be a surplus before the next election? Is that possible? Uh, look, it, it is possible, but it's not really likely. They, they are pretty close. I mean, we're, mm. we're talking about a deficit uh, this year, and that's, you know, um, the election is at the end of this year, so you'd need mm. it uh, this year. Because it would be talking a great a thing for them to be able to say, wouldn't it? Uh, look, they would love it. Um, they would mm. absolutely love it. Uh, having said that, it's not going to be easy. Five billion is is close, but it's uh, still a fair amount to uh, to make up. You know, maybe you can push around some payments on on infrastructure into states, maybe you can, um, you know, turn the pockets of the Reserve Bank upside down and get a bit of money uh, there for a while from a bigger dividend. Um, but best guess is no. Uh, we we are headed, I would say, for surplus in the coming financial year, as as indeed uh, these figures from Treasury are saying as well. Uh, yeah. But not, you know, that'll be after the election, not before. Yeah, the broader uh, forecasts on things like growth, uh, wages growth, is that a concern? Do you feel that we are now slowing down a bit? I mean, we're hearing about uh, a lot of economists now looking to the RBA for the next move to be actually down, not up, possibly. Uh, look, the, the forecasts out of Treasury for this year, and we're halfway through it, uh, and, and next year, you know, aren't enormously different uh, to ours. There's still a few things that they, you know, we see a pickup in wage growth, but not as fast as uh, Treasury does, for example. You know, so there are some elements of difference, uh, but not a big difference. Uh, what would worry me uh, is that uh, Treasury, you know, forecasts for a year or two, and then essentially does straight lines. And that means uh, if you get a shift in the economy, uh, that plays through to the budget, uh, you know, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, Treasury tends to assume that that hangs around. And uh, right now, the good news uh, in the economy and the budget, they're assuming will hang around for the next uh, four years and implicitly uh, thereafter. And I can't say that I'm convinced. Most of uh, the good news uh, is not, you know, the, the government taking tough decisions. In fact, it's spending more and it's taxing less uh, mm -hmm. as a result of its decisions. Um, what you're getting uh, is better news in, in coal and iron ore because China uh, is pushing out, you know, infrastructure projects to try to uh, keep its economy moving. Or the way to think of that is the budget is improving because China is worsening. Right, OK. So how do you see this playing out, uh, given our dependence on China? Um, look, not that great. I, again, I don't think it's a drama uh, in terms of the economic outlook, but it means right. that the further out you look in time, uh, maybe the economy not quite as bright as Treasury would otherwise have it. And as always, any difference in the economy gets exaggerated by the time 
uh, you hit the budget. So, you know, the, the uh, good budget news of the moment may dry up somewhat. Uh, our problem is that between, you know, the, the good conditions today and, and that drying up down the track, uh, there's a federal election and both sides of politics are going to take that love to town. Uh, you know, you're already hearing today about what the coalition's going to do with that extra money and it probably uh, hasn't finished yet. Uh, Labor will um, presumably come up with its own plans there um, and we may see a smaller version of what is a well-known uh, mistake in Australia, the oldest mistake in the budgetary book, uh, of making permanent promises off the back of temporary good news. Right, OK. Well, the tax to GDP cap that the uh, Treasurer was uh, stressed a great deal, of course, 23.9 uh, I think it is. Um, now, is that the big signal that they are going to use a lot of this $9 billion odd for tax cuts? Yeah, look, uh, I'd say it is. Um, it's showing up uh, in the budget papers under the tax side, uh, mm -hmm. even if they're, you know, they're saying those decisions are taken but not yet announced. Um, $9 billion is, is essentially $3 billion a year starting in the coming year. Uh, and, and that's, um, you know, it's enough to add uh, to the tax cuts that are already underway, but that it's not huge. Uh, if you think of that Amanda Vanston uh, benchmark back in 2003, she, she said a, a tax cut back then was the equivalent of a, a sandwich and a milkshake. That's right. Um, this would be sort of $6 a week uh, would, you know, for every taxpayer would be uh, $3 billion a year. Um, you know, you'd have but to so, choose so between your sandwich uh, and your do milkshake. You, do you see the government uh, looking to, to maybe use a bit more than that and deliver more, bigger tax cuts potentially? Yeah, look, potentially. I mean, uh, maybe in the short term the, the budget news will get better. I, I think uh, it'll be challenged over the longer term, but you know, in the short term it could well get uh, even better still. Um, they may choose to slice a bit deeper into the uh, surplus. They haven't spent all of the recent uh, windfall, only uh, half of it. Uh, and, and as I say, they might shake a few hollow logs, you know, Reserve Bank and, and shifting some, some money around. So yes, yeah. uh, the tax cuts uh, out of uh, the coalition government uh, those promises could end up being bigger than they sounding today. OK, moving to Labor, I were Labor to get in, I, I pushed Andrew Lee on, uh, on the tax to GDP cap and uh, he wouldn't uh, obviously com com commit to it. Um, if, however, they were not to get their policy of negative gearing through the Senate, uh, that 1.7 or 9 billion, whatever it is, will that make a great deal of difference to how they fulfil their promises? spending promises um, or, 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 or in other words you know nobody parliament doesn't allow anybody a mandate anymore w winning elections appears not to matter to to opposition parties and to cross benches who still you know oppose like mad uh, you know, particularly mm. when it's populist true of both sides of, of politics when they're in uh, opposition um, you know it essentially says it's getting easier and easier to become prime minister in Australia and harder and harder to do something with it um, because Labor does want to do something different, it wants uh, higher taxes to pay for higher spending. Um, that's a risk. You know, it's possible that Parliament will only allow through um, parts of that. And if it doesn't want to damage the budget on, on the way through, it needs to be sure that it can take Parliament with it or that it stages things or that it reprioritises uh, so it doesn't end up, if you like, uh, hostage to uh, all the promises that it's currently making. Well, indeed, a bit like the, 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 the government and its company tax cuts, which were going to deliver so, exactly like so much on the other mm. side. So, so uh, the one area I did want, you must be continually disappointed by the bi bipartisan approach now on Newstart. Now, why is it that neither side of government uh, wants to do anything substantial about Newstart? Andrew Lee said, oh, well, look, look, it's time for another review. Um, and, and, you know, a review is better than no review, I suppose, but uh, justice a uh, delayed is justice denied. Uh, well, yeah, you know, the, the, um, uh, the Henry Review uh, a decade ago said mm. at the time raise unemployment benefits uh, by $50 a week, and, and that was a decade ago. Um, yeah, look, uh, the budget is, is Australia's national social compact with ourselves, you know, and, and we use it to do two things, to become more prosperous uh, and to be fair. And, and the thing that we've really failed on uh, is fairness, and in particular within that fairness agenda, 
um, unemployment benefits. In Australia, uh, you know, unemployment benefits have not kept, kept up with uh, the age pension, other benefits with, uh, with wages, with minimum wages. Um, Australia has one of the highest minimum wages in the world and relative to that one of the lowest unemployment rates. We are incredibly tough, incredibly cruel uh, to our unemployed. Mm. Well, let's hope that uh, there's a bit more work on that between now and the main budget. Chris Richardson, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Tiki. Right. right, well, after the break, progress on the inland rail project. Finally underway, CEO of the Australian Rail Track Corporation, John Fullerton, next. Now, back to Tiki. Yeah, welcome back. Well, last week at Parks in New South Wales, a little gathering to turn the first sod with a very special historic shovel made in 1912, mind you, marking the construction kickoff of the 1700 kilometre Melbourne to Brisbane inland rail. Well, the track, which uh, will be used by double stacked freight trains, is set to be a game changer for rural Australia, whatever the metro audience might think about it. The first leg of construction, a short stretch from Parks to Narromine, is now officially underway. For more, I spoke to ARTC Managing Director John Fullerton. John Fullerton, nice to talk. Now, last week you had the turning of the first sod with a very old uh, shovel, I think. Must have been a good day. It was a great day. It was a, a great day to celebrate the start of construction uh, between Parks to Narromine. What exactly will this first leg entail? Well, Parks to Narromine is about... Uh, 100 kilometres of existing track that we operate, a regional line, and we've also got about five kilometres of Greenfields track to connect uh, that new section with the east-west uh, track to Perth. Yes, yeah, so you're starting in one of, I guess, one of the easier parts, uh, largely upgrades, I would imagine? That's true. I mean, we always said that Parks to Narromine would be the first uh, construction phase, and then that will be followed next year by the section from Narrow Bride to North Star. So we were focusing on those existing tracks to upgrade them to uh, mainline standard and to accommodate those uh, long double stack trains. John, this inland rail has been a long time coming. A lot of people have said it was a white elephant. What value is it delivering? Well, I think there's two phases of inland rail, really. The, the construction phase, a $10 billion project, employ around about 16,000 people during the construction phase up to 2025 so provides an enormous benefit to regional towns like parks i was there this week and spoke to a, a lot of the local people around the opportunities that this new construction of the of the section for parks to narrow mine will deliver so a lot of local benefits during the construction phase but it's all been built for a purpose it should have been built you know many years ago but inland rail will deliver a whole new corridor between melbourne to brisbane it will allow a lot more of the freight to be carried by rail, which is uh, how it should be carried, particularly over the long distance. But it will also provide a world-class rail connection from some of the most productive farming regions in Australia to, for farmers to be able to export their products through the ports that we connect to already at, uh, in Brisbane, in Newcastle, Port Kembla, Melbourne and, and uh, Port Botany. So it's uh, very important for Australia for the next 50 to 100 years to have this railroad line built to handle the population growth and the, and the big demand in freight that will be required over that period. And obviously you're there uh, right in the middle of the boom, the, the infrastructure part of the cycle. Where are you getting your raw materials for all this track from? Well, inland rail is Australia made, really. We're doing uh, a lot of the material will come from various suppliers. Uh, for the first section from Parks to Narromine, 15,000 tonnes of steel rail will be coming out of Wyala. We've already delivered all that steel along that corridor already. Uh, the concrete sleepers that will be used uh, for the whole uh, project will be, will be constructed or manufactured in Australia. The first 200,000 sleepers have really all been delivered for the section from Parks to Narromine. They were manufactured in New South Wales. And a lot of the quarry products, the earth, uh, and also purchasing motor vehicles and, and hiring heavy plant will all come from Australian businesses predominantly in those regional areas. And would you say you're on track at the moment, you're on schedule? Yes, we are. I mean, uh, we've put a lot of time and effort into getting all the pre-construction work uh, uh, underway, uh, particularly on that Parks to Narromine. We've completed the final designs with the 
engineering companies that we engaged. We awarded a contract uh, back in August to InLink, which is a joint venture between Fulton Hogan and VMD Construction. Uh, they were present at the turning of the sod this week. Uh, they've commenced work and we've got all the material laid out along the corridor. So uh, we're underway. A uh, $300 million construction component, our first major construction for the entire uh, Melbourne to Brisbane railway line. But along the whole corridor now we've got engineers out there doing the final design all for all those sections uh, along that whole inland rail corridor between Melbourne and Brisbane. People say the missing link is that last bit through to the port of Brisbane. What's being done there? Well, there is an existing line, a standard gauge line that was built back in 1995 that does link the port to Acacia Ridge to the port of Brisbane. It's a shared corridor with the passenger trains that, uh, as we know, in all those capital cities, the number of trains are increasing. So it's a shared corridor. Uh, and so there, over time, there will need to be, we need to look at ways on how we can improve the capacity for the connection to uh, the port of Brisbane. But there is an existing narrow gauge and standard gauge line there today. But won't that be a, a blockage by the time you've got this U Butte uh, inland rail up and running? Well, most of the freight that we're using Melbourne to Brisbane inland rail is freight that's uh, generated in Australia and is consumed by Australians. So yeah, that uh, is the case today with all the freight that gets delivered to Acacia Ridge is uh, consumed by Queenslanders or generated by Queenslanders for export to the southern states. So that will be the primary source of the volumes that will be carried on inland rail from day one. But of course we recognise the importance to provide better connections to the ports and a lot of work's being done between the federal government and, and the Queensland government now to look at what will need to be done to upgrade and improve the connections to the port. There is a connection there today. Uh, it will use, serve its purpose for the interim period, but over the longer term there need, need to be a better solution. As I understand it, uh, the inland rail is now going via Wellcamp Airport, the Wagner's Airport near Toowoomba. So presumably there will be more export driven business out of there eventually as well. That's true. I mean, the Toowoomba catchment area is a very important generator of freight and a consumer of freight. But also the agricultural districts in around Moree, around Gundawindi, those sorts of areas, you know, currently move a lot of their produce for export by road uh, through to the port. Inland rail will change that. Uh, it's connected to, you know, the major freight centres. It goes through some of the most productive farming regions. It will provide a spine to allow farmers to export their products far more efficiently, bigger trains, heavier axle loads, all lowers cost to producers and that's good for them and it's good for the Australian economy. And John, how are you going uh, where the rail is going straight through uh, the farmers, land, community consultation, uh, uh, villages? Have you got a reasonable relationship or is there more work to be done in terms of settling communities and landowners? Look, there's always work to be done. I mean, this is a, a big project and like any project that's being built in Greenfields areas like the, we do have between Narrow Mine and Narrow Bry, and in many parts of the Queensland border. There are a lot of new construction will be required through some of those farmlands. And yes, uh, a lot of farmers are concerned about the impact the railway will have on their businesses. So what sort of deals are you doing with them? Well, I think the first, what well, the process we're going through at the moment, we've got a, a two kilometre study corridor that we've got engineers looking at where will they finally locate that final 60 metre wide rail corridor. So the numbers of people that will be impacted will reduce as we go through that process. But of course, you know, we'll look at ways to try to avoid cutting farms in half where we can, but where, we, that where that's inevitable, we'll be looking at how we can ensure that you know, farm machinery, stock, whatever is necessary to make those farms productive, we will look at how we can do through that the construction phase. So we're working, we've got a big team of people out there, very committed to working with every individual landowner to try and explain how it will be built, what it will look like, how we can minimise the impact on their farms, but also to where we do have to acquire land to compensate them fairly for selling that land to us to allow that railway to be built. And finally, can I ask, you're on track for 2024-25, yeah? Absolutely. We're started in Parks and Narrow Mine, the first big construction project, and we're now underway with the Narrow Bride North Star to happen next year. And on budget? It's a $10 billion project over a 10-year period, so we're yeah. looking good. John Fullerton, congratulations on the first turn of the sod, as I say, and we look forward to following you on the way. Yeah, thanks, Tiggy. Thanks you very much.
Now to something global to finish with. After two weeks of tense negotiations, leaders from nearly 200 countries have finally agreed on universal, transparent climate change rules. The agreement made at the United Nations Climate Talks in Poland is aimed at cutting emissions and curbing global warming, but critics say it doesn't go far enough. It is so decided. A landmark decision to curb climate change. Leaders from 190 countries brokered a deal at a two-week-long United Nations summit in Poland. The rule book allows countries to put into action the principles in the 2015 Paris Climate Change Accord, which the Trump administration has promised to abandon. Right now, we're facing a man-made disaster of global scale. Among the key agreements, a deal on how countries should report their greenhouse gas emissions and the efforts they're taking to reduce them. Poor countries also secured guarantees for financial support to help them cut emissions. However, two major climate change issues were kicked down the road for next year. Activists and scientists are concerned that governments are not responding to global warming fast enough. A recent report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change also lays out a dire forecast. It found the world has only about 12 years to avoid 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming above pre-industrial levels. And that global warming could worsen disasters like the deadly California wildfires and powerful hurricanes that hit the U.S. this year. We need new technologies, we need new food systems, uh, transportation systems, uh, we need to make climate change a voting issue. The U.S. was among the countries that pushed back the hardest at the summit. A scientist urged world leaders to take action now before it's too late. The continuation of our civilizations and the natural world upon which we depend is in your hands. I'm Natasha Chen reporting. Man, that was the great Sir David Attenborough. 94, I think he is. That's all for the show tonight. Tomorrow night, CEO of the Australian Business Council, Jennifer Westacott, with a year-end interview. See you tomorrow night at 4.30pm or tonight on Catch Up at 10pm. Thanks for your company.